So we have uh, Professor Mark Alexander from the University of Cape Town. Uh, he has visited uh, India often as and has been uh, at IIT Madras very much. He got his PhD from the University of Witwatersrand and is a renowned expert in many aspects related to concrete science and technology. Uh, he has done a lot of work on aggregates for concrete, on uh, aggregate reactivity and has spent a lot of time working on durability. And uh, we are uh, very grateful to him for pushing durability based design. He has, uh, this has, he has been a strong proponent of design for durability and the need to do tests at the site for uh, ensuring that the durability is, uh, is achieved as per the requirements, not just restricting to uh, test results. He is a fellow of the University of Cape Town and also a fellow of RILEM. RILEM is uh, an, a place where researchers uh, meet, it is sort of an association that researchers in construction materials and structures and systems um, meet, work together to uh, uh, bring about new uh, uh, reports, bring about recommendations that could lead to standards. And Mark has been uh, instrumental in many groups within RILEM and elsewhere that work together on durability of concrete. So we are very grateful to you, Mark, yeah. that you Thank are here. You. And a uh, couple of things that come to mind to ask you is that it is very difficult to talk about durability to practicing engineers. And you have gone one step further and you have said that all structures should be tested after construction. Now, it must have been an uphill struggle. So, what would be a word of advice to those of us who want to emulate mm. what we have, you have done and take this all over the world? Uh, not all structures need to be tested. I think critical structures need to be tested. Okay. But anyway, I think there are, there are two things that we have to do. The first thing is you've got to do good science. You have to be sure of your science. You have to do good. You have to be able to show that the work you do is robust, is 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 supportable, it's uh, and 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 it's also practical. Second thing is that you have to establish your credibility, and credibility is established by rubbing shoulders with people in the industry, by getting out to the forums where they meet, by meeting them on site, by discussing their concerns with them, uh, by, by being in involved in the problems that they're involved in, so that they learn to trust you. Uh, and then when you start to talk, you talk with some voice of authority. Um, and we found it took us about 10 or 15 years to establish that credibility. Because when you first came along, they said these young upstart engineers, these researchers, they're trying to tell us how to do our job. Uh, and they were very resistant. But after a while, and with slow uh, work done, or the work done uh, that we did, they slowly began to accept that what we were trying to do was actually to improve concrete construction for everybody. Um, but it did take quite a, uh, quite a while. But I think we, we sort of got there now. Well, Mark is a certified professional engineer. And uh, that explains why you feel that there is a need to keep uh, talk the same language as the industry does. This often does not happen because uh, a lot of the university professors or the university researchers are confined to the university. Mm -hmm. And many of uh, us may be averse to actually going to the field and we feel that that would dilute our research when we come down to what can be actually used in, field, in mm -hmm. the field. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to someone who feels that it is not necessary to dilute or to bring down the level of how you communicate your work to mm. someone in the field? I've often had this dilemma. I've asked myself, am I an academic first and an engineer second? Or am I an engineer first and an academic second? And it depends exactly where I am. At IITM, I'm an academic first. But when I'm at home and I'm on the construction site, I'm an engineer first. So I think you have to learn to wear two hats, at least. And I think one has to realize, you know, you get different kinds of engineers. Let's just be, be honest about that. You get engineers who, you get engineering scientists, people who delve into the science and make sense of it, and who've done extremely good work, um, and help us to develop the knowledge and, uh, and so on that we need. And then you get the engineering 
more the, the research practitioners, the people who put that into practice. And I think the, 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 the danger here is that in the university environment, um, we're judged really on criteria that have very little to do with, with implementation, with practical carrying out, carrying over our, of our work into, into, into the industry. Um, and so we tend, because of the environments within which we work, to, to concentrate more on just developing the knowledge and leaving it at that. Uh, but we've always felt in our research unit that if we cannot make an impact on engineering practice, then what are we really here for? Uh, so we've taken that as, a, as, a, a, as an absolute starting point for our work. We want to influence engineering practice. And if you go and look at the, uh, at the, uh, the sort of principles or the guiding uh, principles behind uh, our research unit, Comsairu, that's clearly stated there. And so we make sure that we're interacting constantly with people in the industry. We have them in on our forums, we have them in on our seminars, we sit with them annually and talk to them about uh, progress and things like that. I'm sure you do similar things here, but we've made that uh, an absolute guiding principle of what we do. Well, you have been acclaimed as an excellent teacher, educator and mentor. We find that uh, in our usual curriculum, we don't spend a lot of effort on materials, durability that should be taught to all engineers. Often it is just an optional subject mm. to learn about concrete and durability is maybe just a few lectures mm. and some students might not even take it. Mm. And what they spend more time on is the design aspects mm. where we are looking at design for loads and serviceability. And durability sort of gets mentioned but there is not much emphasis. Do you think this should change and or is, has it changed enough? Well, if we look at the problems we have in real construction, then it hasn't changed. Uh, that's the reality. And, and the problem is that the curriculum is always under pressure. You know, everybody in the department wants to vie for their place in the curriculum. They say, now my subject is much more important than your subject, so I need more lectures than you need. And, and then somebody else says, no, no, but my subject is actually the really important one. And of course, everybody's subject is important that we have to acknowledge that. So it's really a question of where uh, the department sees its role. I think that's one thing. The department must take a view on, uh, on, on how this should be divided. But also it's a question of whether we should be saying to our graduating students and to young practitioners, listen, what you've got now is just the ticket out the door. Now you can go out and pretend to be an engineer. You know, you're going to take a while to be one, but you can at least pretend now. Uh, but you need a lot more information and knowledge if you really want to become a good engineer. And start to inculcate the idea of continuing education, continuing development. So a lot of what we teach in durability only comes at the postgraduate level. I would love to have it in the undergraduate, but then I'm fighting with the water engineers and the, and, and the traffic engineers and the structural engineers and and the management guys, and, and, and that often doesn't lead to the best relationship. So we've realized the need to, if you lo upload the curriculum at the postgraduate level, and that is uh, achieving quite well. Well, you have visited India uh, several times. What would you advise us on the way forward in uh, bringing about this change that we will require to design for uh, longer durability and uh, to get the most efficiency out of our materials? Now that's a really big question. <laughs> and I would be very foolish to even begin to think that I could answer that question because, um, I mean, I've observed your construction just in traveling around. I haven't had much ch opportunity to visit sites. I've been on a few. Uh, but it seems to me, and we have much the same problem in, in South Africa with being a developing country, that we span the entire range of concrete application, right from the very sophisticated stuff at the top end, right down to the very basic stuff. But it's in that middle region that I think we can do a lot of work. And here I think we need to be developing the performance approaches. But it's also around just helping the, the average concrete contractor to do a good job on site. I mean, understanding about how much water to put in the mix, how to mix it properly, how to compact, how to cure, just doing those things well. And I think if we just did those things well, we would make a huge impact on the quality of our construction. Well. Uh I first met uh, Professor Mark Alexander in 1987 and at that time he was doing a lot of interesting work on aggregates. Now when we talk about aggregates today, 
we are finding that we are not having good aggregates mm. places like uh, uh, south of india we generally expected that all aggregates available for concrete would be good we are running out of such good aggregates in many parts of india we are not getting good aggregates so they could be a compulsion to use aggregates which are not really ideal mm. in terms of mineralogy you have done a lot of work also on alkali aggregate reactivity now how do we prepare ourselves and what should we be doing uh, more of well we have the same problem we used to have natural aggregates in in the western cape uh, in the last 10 years we've run out of them mostly so now we've moved to crushed uh, crushed sands so all of a sudden we have a, a shift and and these are reactive aggregates these are uh, um, alkali reactive material so we've put more reactive material into the mix uh, and I was a little bit uh, surprised when the industry made this shift to crushed aggregates without even thinking about whether this might influence alkali reactivity so we've recently been looking into that and it turns out that maybe it isn't a problem but uh, we didn't know that until we looked into it so I think the thing with I think what we what engineers do not appreciate is the huge role that aggregates play in concrete, and they occupy seventy percent at least usually of the concrete by volume, and therefore their properties uh, in many ways determine the properties of the concrete itself. We love to think about the paste, we love to think about cements and binders because they're the exciting stuff, but the aggregates actually have a huge influence on the properties. So I guess what I'm saying is that we should also not forget that aggregates are an important part, uh, understand how they work uh, in concrete itself. We, we, we do our aggregate testing, but we, it's bringing them together into that composite material and how does that work? Um, and that's a debate that I've had with, with many of uh, the people here at, at IIT is what, what should we be testing? Should we be testing pastes? Should we be testing mortars? Should we be testing concretes? And I think you test what you need to test for why you need to test it. But what, I'm, uh, what I would make a, uh, a general case for is that if it's at all possible, let's test the real material. Because until we do that, we won't pick up all the effects, in particular the effects of the aggregates. Well, one last question. We've been talking about problems with concrete and we know we have difficulties with concrete. Then why concrete? Is concrete here to stay or will there be a new material that is going to replace concrete? What do you expect the future to hold? Well, I may not be here for that much longer to see what the future holds, but I think that this material concrete is just absolutely essential to modern life, to development of the planet. Uh, what we have to do is do it a lot better because we waste a lot of it. We, we don't use it very sustainably. But to be honest, what other material is there that can fulfill this? I'm sure there will be many developments. We will, the cements will change, or at least they'll change in ways that we will have to learn to manage. Uh, as we run out of aggregates, what can we use in their place? Uh, and many of these things will change, but ultimately, if one thinks of the developmental needs of places like India, of Africa, which are the continents that are rising at the moment, uh, this is the material that is going to have to take us through the next, certainly several decades. And then, who knows? Uh, I won't be around to worry about that, but some of you will. Thank you.